and uh, we'll go ahead and move right into our next case. So guess what? History is about the same, exam pretty much the same, and here's our ultrasound. So some of you probably have already caught on to these pictures being a little bit different. Here's our transabdominal view of the uterus. We've got, looks like some kind of cyst over here, cyst over here, maybe something going on here, mass or cyst or flu, I'm not sure. Looking up in the rest of the abdomen, this is the spleen and the left kidney. We don't see any free fluid up here. And this is the right kidney and Morrison's, I believe, and I don't see any obvious free fluid. Uh, now we're on to transvaginal findings. So we see the uterus, we see free fluid here. So this is a sagittal view of the uterus. Don't see, certainly don't see an intrauterine pregnancy. The endometrial stripe looks thin, there's nothing in there. Uh, but we do see some, so we're close to the cervix, we see some free fluid here and it has some echoes in it. There's gray stuff floating in there. We see it also over here, we see gray stuff within that free fluid. So this is not just free fluid, this is complex free fluid. This is blood that is clotted, okay, or pus. Uh, but when we're thinking about ectopic, we got to be thinking this is probably blood. And then we get views of the adnexa. This is over on the left. And what we see here is a complex mass with increased echogenicity. This is part of the adnexa. It looks like the left as well. There's a simple cyst and some increased echogenicity here. And this is just another sweep through that thing. And it looks like we've got increased echogenic mass in the left adnexa and some cystic material as well. So this is all concerning for ectopic pregnancy. So our diagnosis here, take a look at that, see what you think. It's not normal, probably not undetermined location. This is likely ectopic with signs of rupture with that complex free fluid. So clot in the pelvis, complex free fluid equals rupture. So what's our plan? Operative therapy. This is not a candidate for medical therapy. Even though the ectopic looks pretty small and the patient's stable, we've got complex free fluid. This person needs surgery. Don't send them home. So again, just to review these, medical therapy for ectopic, stable and reliable, small, absent rupture. This is where our patient does not fit, cross off, moves into this patient, this category because they have signs of rupture, they need surgery. So just to emphasize, really important to look for free fluid. Look for it in the pelvis, look for it to be complex versus simple, and look for it up in the rest of the abdomen. Do your abdominal portions of your FAST exam. All right, gonna move right along to the next case. So things are a little different here. 24 year old female, vaginal bleeding, heavier than a usual period. Now there's clots and tissue passing, lower abdominal cramps, irregular periods, and the rest of this is about the same. We do see some blood at the os. Everything else is the same except we have this increased bleeding more than a period clots and tissue transabdominally we don't see that much here we are transabdominally no significant free fluid no obvious masses in the adnexa transvaginally our right ovary and left ovary look pretty normal we don't see anything within the uterus the hcg is 2324 so we saw no intrauterine pregnancy and our hcg is above the quote-unquote discriminatory zone, although I'd like to get rid of that term. The interpretation of our ultrasound, there's no intrauterine pregnancy, no significant free fluid, and nothing in the adnexa. So what's our diagnosis here? Take a look. Pregnancy of undetermined location, even with the higher HCG. There is a significant percentage of pregnancies, uh, like 1 in 12 or 1 in 6, somewhere around there, that will be normal despite not having seen an intrauterine pregnancy with an HCG above the discriminatory zone. So what that means is you cannot rule out ectopic, you cannot rule out normal pregnancy, you cannot rule out miscarriage yet, even though we have this higher HCG level. So undetermined location. Now because of the history, not because of anything in the ultrasound, but because of the history of heavy bleeding with clots and tissue, there's a fair chance that this could be a miscarriage and the patient should know that that is a good chance, although don't tell them that that is exclusively the diagnosis. And they should also know that an ectopic and even a normal pregnancy is not completely excluded. So the plan, what are you gonna do? Again, they can go home, repeat ultrasound in a week. 48 hour HCG, not gonna help anything, not gonna change anything. And just again, emphasizing this point, if you do the whole ultrasound, you look at the adnexa, you look for free fluid, you get complete views through the uterus, the 48 hour HCG can be a thing of the past. You can eliminate it from your practice. Just This is just a reminder to correlate all the data with your ultrasound data, and in this case, the history of the heavy bleeding. So again, we go all the way back to history. The most important thing in the patient evaluation, I'd love to say it's always the ultrasound, but a lot of times the history and the physical are just as, if not more important than the ultrasound. Getting the history of heavy bleeding, passing clots and tissue, 
put you more on the side of this probably being miscarriage. Although, like we said, ectopic and even a potential normal pregnancy are not excluded. Moving right along, case six. Uh huh. 24 year old female, vaginal bleeding, lower cramps, irregular periods, no past medical history, no fertility treatment, normal exam or similar exam to prior. Diffuse. To, oh, hmm, looks about the same. And what do we see on ultrasound? Well, we've got a retroverted uterus. The fundus points posteriorly and we've got a sac within the uterus it looks in the about the right place here's the endometrial sac it's high it's sort of the fundus but it has a weird shape and i don't really see anything in it and complete sweeps through there again didn't show anything within that sac uh so what's our diagnosis here is this normal mm, doesn't look normal it's a big sac with nothing in it uh, so this is a pregnancy with an unclear or probably poor prognosis okay so this is this is one of the harder ones this is the ones that we don't talk about that much but these are things that we be, need to be prepared to talk to our patients about and prepared to recognize the findings. So let's talk about the plan and then we'll, we'll dive into the findings a little bit more. So what are we going to do? This patient can be discharged home. They should probably have a repeat ultrasound in a week or so. But they should also be counseled that things don't look normal and that there is a fair chance that this pregnancy isn't going to turn out well. I, I don't think you should commit 100% to this being a miscarriage because you could be wrong. I've been wrong before, but you should let them know that things don't look normal and we definitely recommend follow-up. And in some cases, you might be able to make truly the diagnosis of miscarriage or abortion and other cases that are iffy. Let them know that things don't look 100% normal and the follow-up is recommended. But they still, 48 hours isn't going to change anything. As long as you've looked at the adnexa completely and you've looked for free fluid. All right, just some reminders here of what pregnancy looks like as it progresses along. So early on, around five weeks, the first thing you're gonna see is a just a simple gestational sac. And this doesn't really mean anything. This is just an early finding and it could be even a pseudo sac or an abnormal sac. As you progress, the next thing you're gonna find is a yolk sac. Now this is a true pregnancy. And assuming it's in the right place within the uterus, this can be considered a normal intrauterine pregnancy. Next up, we see a fetal pole. Typically, by the time you can see a fetal pole, you should be able to identify cardiac activity and notice the sac gets bigger. So the sac gets bigger proportional to what's inside of it. So if you see a big sac with nothing inside it, it's not a normal sac. And then later, the kid gets you know, a college degree and feet and arms and starts talking back to you and you need to slap. So just a reminder, right around here, you should definitely be able to find a heartbeat. Uh, a few other things that you might see early on that are abnormal, some of which are not so great, some of which aren't that big of a deal. Sometimes you'll see a little bit of fluid collection around the gestational sac like this, or here's our gestational sac here, our decidual reaction, little bit of fluid collection, that's a subchorionic hemorrhage, and these are small, so they're, they're outlined for you. And the important thing about these is these are okay. These typically have a good prognosis as long as they're small. And some people might refer to this as the implant bleed, although I'm not sh really 100% sure what that means. I think it's a made-up word. Um, this is a little bit bigger. Does this mean the patient's going to miscarry? I don't really know. There's not a 100% prediction rate, but the prognosis does get worse the bigger the hemorrhage is. This is a pretty large one. The prognosis is probably poor, although I still wouldn't definitively call it and tell the patient that they're going to miscarry. I would tell them there's some features that need followed up. And again, this is not an exact correlation, but the prognosis tends to get worse the bigger the size of the subchorionic hemorrhage. Is it exactly linear? I don't know. But bigger subchorionic hemorrhage uh, tends to be worse prognosis, so try to remember that, but don't be too definitive or committal about it. Um, abnormal sacs. So we talked about how as the pregnancy progresses, the sac gets bigger in proportion to the contents inside of it. So when you see a large sac, and you can measure it to get a, an estimated date, but if there's a large sac and the things inside of it don't correlate with how large it is, then that's a poor prognosis. And this is a sac that is big enough. We should start to we should be seeing some kind of fetal pole in a sac this size. This is another example of a large sac, and really there's nothing in there. So that's a pregnancy with probably a poor prognosis. Now, you have to be careful because abnormal sacs may occur in ectopic pregnancy. So if you haven't done it yet and you see an abnormal sac, make sure you've gotten good views of the adnexa completely. This is an example of a low-lying sac. Uh, this is, again, high risk for miscarriage, but you've also got to think about the interstitial pregnancy, and that's the topic for another day. But interstitial ectopics are hard to diagnose, and they have high risk for rupture and 
usually uh, the patients tend to do worse because they bleed more and they're found later. So that's why we talk about finding a properly placed intrauterine pregnancy. And that's our caution there is when you see a sac that maybe isn't quite in the right place or low lying, you need to think about an interstitial ectopic. And then the last little topic I want to go through is fetal demise. Now I have said to some people that unfortunately being the ultrasound person in your department makes you the expert in diagnosing fetal demise, which is probably one of the least pleasant conversations to have with our patients, but it's a necessary conversation and we're it's really not fair for us to cop out and say that we're not willing to have this conversation with our patients. It's something we have to do. So this is an example of a fetal pole and hopefully you've already looked with M mode or you've looked, stared at this thing for a few minutes in different planes and you haven't found a heartbeat. So then the only time you should ever put color on a fetus this size is when you're already 99% certain there is no heartbeat. This is just one final way to document the absence of any fetal cardiac activity. So again, don't put color on a fetus unless you're already 99% certain there is no heartbeat and that this is fetal demise. But once you think it is fetal demise and you're pretty confident in that, demonstrating the lack of color flow gives you another extra way to document that. Here's an example of fetal demise. We see a sac that's probably too small for this fetal pole and we've tried M mode, we couldn't see any cardiac activity. Although in this day and age, it's you can just save a clip that's zoomed in and shows no cardiac activity. And then you, again, you can also do the color flow. And how do you recognize fetal demise? Well, if you know and you can remember the normal appearance and the progression of pregnancy and the way it looks in the first trimester, this isn't gonna be that difficult. So some of the signs of a poor prognosis are a large sac without the proportionate progression in the size of the fetus. So if you see a, a sac that's seven weeks or bigger, or especially when you get to like eight weeks and there's no fetus in there at all, that's a poor prognosis. That's not likely to be a normal pregnancy. Just don't forget to think about ectopic. If you see a pregnancy that's progressed to the point of having a fetal pole and there's no cardiac activity, that's a really poor prognosis and that that is a likely miscarriage or a fetal demise and our patients should be counseled to that. If there's a huge mismatch in the size of the sac and the fetus, then that's also a poor prognosis. And usually this is what you find with fetal demise. You'll find a sac that has continued to get bigger and you may measure it and get a gestational sac measure of, uh, of around 11 weeks and you'll measure the fetal pole and it measures six weeks and there's no cardiac activity. That again is a poor prognosis, fetal demise, and patients need to be counseled. And when you see a very large subchorionic hemorrhage, likely a poor prognosis, although there's a little more uncertainty there, so be careful about how you, you counsel patients on that. But these are all things that we need to look for and recognize so that we can counsel our patients appropriately and let them know that things don't look well. And there's it's a whole separate talk on how to talk to patients about this, but these are conversations we need to be willing to have with our patients. So the management of these is cautiously educate the patients. Again, depending on what you find, if it's definitive or not quite definitive, caution them in that direction. They should usually get a repeat ultrasound in about a week, and they need to know the indications for return. So heavier bleeding, syncope, increased pain, or fever, because some of these patients, if they don't pass all the tissue, can be at risk for tain products and infection, endometritis, and those kind of things. So they also need to be cautioned about that. So just to summarize the things that we're talking about, there's really only three primary presentations of these patients, and really there's two with in shock being the last, but pelvic pain and or vaginal bleeding, and then the patients in shock who are this already a ruptured ectopic who looks sick. There's only a few ultrasound findings we have to elicit. Now we have to work hard and make sure we're diligent to try to elicit these findings, but there's not that many findings. The properly placed intrauterine pregnancy, we want to measure dates, we want to look for cardiac activity, we want to completely evaluate the adnexa for any masses, and we want to look in the complete abdomen and the pelvis for free peritoneal fluid or complex peritoneal fluid. Only a few diagnoses, a normal intrauterine pregnancy, an ectopic pregnancy with or without signs of rupture, then there's the whole pregnancy of undetermined location, which just means you're uncertain and follow-up is necessary, and then there's the pregnancies with the unclear or the poor prognosis. And again, those are the ones with the sacs that don't match, the fetal pole without heart tones, or the really large subchorionic hemorrhages. And the dispositions, most of these patients can go home. Most of them don't need to be reevaluated for at least a week. And they all need to have appropriate counseling uh, depending on what you have found and what the possible outcomes are. Then there are a few patients that can be selected for medical therapy for ectopic pregnancy. Again, usually in consultation with your OB-GYN folks, but you should already know the findings and should know if they're a candidate or not. And then the patients who obviously are surgical candidates for ectopic pregnancy because they have signs of rupture 
or the pregnancy is too big. And again, our disclaimer, and this is really important, don't forget this, don't forget the progression. Small sac, as the sac gets bigger, the findings within it become more complex. So sac is bigger, a little simple yolk sac, a bigger sac, even more, we see fetal pole, and then huge sac taking up the whole uh, mother's abdomen and baby with parts who can talk to you and write his name. And don't forget, by this point, we should be seeing a heart.